Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, I'm happy to be back again here. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, this problem of, uh, which comes from wave turbulence theory, which I'll explain in a moment. And, and uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Bin Min Stran. Um, and it's not a PDE. Uh, nevertheless, I uh, would like to tell you, and so, so, so for me it's completely new. It's completely new philosophy. Uh, but it comes from a PDE. It comes from uh, a way of trying to understand certain types of phenomena of PDEs. So I would like to spend a little bit of time to tell you how one go from the PDE to this kind of equations. So just that you see that, uh, uh, you know, the physical meaning behind this kind of equations. There are other models which are not wave turbulence, which gives you similar structure. For example, Boltzmann equation and uh, what is called fragmentation coagulation equations. And some mathematical analysis that I will describe may be relevant for uh, this kind of equations as well. But I will focus about one particular equation, which is uh, the three wave uh, at wave turbulence equation. Okay. So uh, the relevant references are the following. This is the paper where we have this result. It is uh, on the archive. And uh, then there is this work of Escobedo Velasquez, which I will uh, come back and explain its relationship. In this work, there is also um, derivation of, an, of uh, the phenomena of uh, energy cascade, which I will explain uh, what it is. And uh, there is some works on the Boltzmann equations, which is also related in the sense that the mathematics is, have a lot of similarities with this work. And here, I uh, put a paper that I will also refer to it, although it is not about the standard uh, form of the kinetic equation that I'm going to talk about. It is of the same nature, uh, the same physical nature as kinetic equation, and this is the, what is known as coagulation equations. As, as you will see, there are a lot of similarities between them. But the method of analysis in this problem, here it was also proven that there is some sort of uh, uh, energy cascade to, to infinity, but uh, the method is different and the nature of the result is also different. So this is, you know, some, it would be nice to refer to this from time to time to get a feeling of what's going on. All right. So in some sense, this is the deepest part of the story. It says the following. Boltzmann came with a great idea. If you have 10 to the 25 particles in a room, it is not reasonable to try to describe the dynamics of this kind of a system by Newton's equations of motion. That's too many variables for any computer you can imagine. So what do you do? Instead, you say, let me describe the system by looking at a small volume around the point x and see how many particles there are there with a given velocity v. So in other words, we will describe the system of 10 to the 25 particles in terms of a distribution in the phase space of the position and the velocity. So you have a function f of x and t, such that if you multiply it by dx dv, you will find how many particles there are with a given velocity in a neighborhood of the velocity and also position. And then the equation that you get for this kind of a density is an equation only in six dimensions plus time instead of 10 to the 25. So here it is. This is Boltzmann equation. This is how you get Boltzmann equation. So that you have the density, f of pt, and you compute the derivative, and you will get that it is some kind of uh, nonlinear functional, which is known as the collision term, and which Boltzmann computed explicitly for Newtonian classical particles. And this Q is not, is not a, a you know, it's not a polynomial in F. It is rather a complicated non-linear and non-local operator, which is quadratic in this case. Now, the great idea about 
uh, that came much later is to say, let us do the same philosophy for waves of equations which are expected to be chaotic, which are going to have all frequencies floating around. So how are you going to make a good description of a system which is going to be chaotic? It has also many, many, many variables, so let's do something else instead. Instead of looking at the equation itself, let us take the solution of the equation, Fourier transform it, take absolute value squared, and think of this as the density of the momentum. If the equation is homogeneous and we forget about x dependence, then we have only dependence of the momentum distribution as a function of time. So you get this kind of an equation. And this is exactly where these equations come from. You take, for example, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in a box, you Fourier transform it, you take the Fourier transform of the solution absolute value squared, you write down the equations of motion for this quantity, you think of it as density, and you get a new equation. This equation is very complicated, and now you have to do all kinds of fancy approximations, and you try to prove that this kind of an equation on a certain time scale gives you essentially the same behavior as the original nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Now, this is a very hard problem, open problem. I don't know how to do it. And uh, I think there are a few people here who are working on this problem and made progress on this problem. So they know much uh, more than me about this problem. Uh, you can ask how much it is known about this problem. So the main thing which is known about this problem from a few years ago is basically the work of uh, Spohn, in which he considered the NLS on a lattice, and he used quantum field theory techniques uh, to show that there is some kind of uh, uh, approximate kinetic equation for this kind of an equation when it is on the lattice. In this case, the Fourier space is not, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the Fourier space, uh, the Fourier space uh, where p, the variable p is, in this case will be on a toes, and that's what he, he did. Okay. All right, so next. So uh, what, is, uh, what is the expectation from this kind of equations? Uh, the equation that I'm going to talk about is the kinetic equation or the equation that I wrote before, dF dt is equal to QFF, is called three wave equation because it's quadratic in the quadratic in F. And uh, <coughs> many such equations were derived by applied mathematicians and physicists, and uh, it is used for a description of uh, phenomena like uh, atmospheric. Uh, processes or, or water waves and other, other systems in which the, the nonlinearity is quadratic. When the nonlinearity is quadratic, then you get the equation that I'm going to talk about. So, uh, and what he's observed, and this is what we would like to do, is the phenomena of energy cascade. This is a phenomena which was observed experimentally in many kind of nonlinear uh, mechanical systems. You start with an initial condition, which is, say, has energy distribution between 1 and 2. All the momentum in the beginning is between 1 and 2. And you look what happens as a function of time. And what you see is, at least as far as the kinetic equation is concerned, you see is that this, the distribution drifts. And it drifts in a very particular way. Part of the solution simply go to infinity. So part of the momentum distribution simply becomes localized farther and farther away, all the way to infinity. This is exactly what is called the process of energy cascade. You start with a system in which everything is nice and smooth, and then as time goes on, you see that uh, waves which are shorter and shorter in length are being produced, right? So, uh, yes, both, both. Right. So when the equation when the equation is driven, of course the total energy of the system is infinite. So it is one kind of problem. Actually, I'm going to talk about the problem in which the initial condition is finite energy and there is no forcing term. It's still happening. 
it's still happening. Okay. So, uh, so, um, okay. So for fluids, uh, there is the famous <coughs> work of uh, uh, Kolmogorov, which uh, talked about uh, energy cascade and the solution. And you know, there is Kolmogorov solution, which shows that there is some kind of a, a scaling, which tells you how the momentum distribution or the energy distribution will be. And uh, and Zakharov extended this. Uh, to the e case of uh, wave turbulence equation, and he also found a solution, which is of this type. So he found a solution. So this solution is time independent, and it has infinite energy because this gamma is not sufficiently large. So that's uh, the analog of uh, that's the analog of uh, the Kolmogorov uh, scaling. Okay, so uh, what we are going to do, and what I'm going to talk about is to take one of those equations, which is in this case the uh, three wave equation, which comes from quadratic nonlinearities, and uh, take an initial condition which is localized, at f and so it has finite energy, there is no forcing, there is no source, and ask what happens as t goes to infinity. What's omega p? What? What's omega p? Omega of p is the energy of a wave with frequency p, the dispersion relation. So, uh, so the energy of the system is going to be the density of the momentum times the dispersion relation. And the question is, if there is energy cascade, by the way, there is also reverse energy cascade, which was observed, in which you have the momentum goes from finite number all the way down to zero. So, for example, if you look at the equations for uh, the kinetic equations which you, you derive let's say the analog of Boltzmann equations for uh, Bo Bose quantum particles, you will find out that the natural behavior should be that it has to go to do a reverse cascade all the way down to zero, which means the formation of a Bose condensate. So, this is, so there is a, a, a significant physical meaning to the reverse uh, uh, energy cascade as well. Okay. So, uh, all right, so then the question is, can we prove, can we prove that this, uh, this, uh, this quantity, which is the energy, which is the energy at time t around, around p, uh, moves to infinity? But I mean moves to infinity in what sense, okay? So the claim that what we would like to show is that actually what happens is that uh, this function is actually a distribution and this distribution we can show actually converges to a delta function at infinity. So another word, uh, a natural way of describing the process of energy cascade is to look, the sol look at the solutions, look at the dynamics in the space of distributions, even if you start with something nice and smooth. Forget about uniqueness, forget about existence in the strong sense, just look at it in the, look at the dynamics in this, in this kind of a more general space and see if there are solutions with the property that uh, after finite time, or maybe after infinite time, uh, have a support at the point at infinity. Okay, so that's that's what we want to do. Yes. So if one comes back to the Hamiltonian system, yes, having uh, you say that the energy cascade is infinite, but it's not the momentum, it means a singularity. Yes, of course. And if it happens after finite time, it also means a singularity. Yes. Okay. So now. <laughs> Now, yeah, it, right. So if you take nonlinear, right, if you take the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that uh, the the people here take, it is cubic, and so the cubic NLS because of uh, because of the energy conservation, the solution will not blow up in a finite time in Fourier space. You will not see this thing happening in in finite time, but it may happen in infinite time. But this is, I'm talking about the three-wave equation, which is quadratic. 
Now, so it's interesting to ask what happens for the case of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which is quadratic, if you want to get a kinetic equation, you have to use a nonlinearity which is not self-adjoint, because otherwise you have absolute value of u and then you don't know how to get kinetic equation. So you have to take nonlinearity of the form u squared or u star squared or u star u or something like that. Any of such of these equations does not conserve, not energy and not momentum. And in principle, it can have a shock after finite time. A shock after finite time means that you get stuff like that after finite time. So that's what it means. After finite times, if you get something like that, it's a shock. That's all. Actually, we prove that this is the shape of the singularity. In, in P space. In P space. But in X space? There is no X space in this problem. Because, uh, yeah, we don't know how to do this kind of things for the non-homogeneous problem. Yes? Uh, is there a situation in which C goes to zero and the product C delta is finite? Uh, well, in the I'm sure there are such cases. So, for example, um, the work of uh, Escobedo and Velasquez, which I mentioned before, this is for four-wave equation. In other words, it's like cubic NLS. In this case, what they actually show is that part of the solution goes to zero frequency. It concentrates at the delta function at zero. I'm not sure that they actually prove that it is delta function, but they show that it does concentrate at, at uh, frequency zero. And then they showed that uh, but they also, I think, took the initial condition to have already a delta function at zero. They just showed that there is more stuff going there. And then they also showed that everything else in any finite interval away from zero actually goes to zero. So where is everything else going? So it cannot go everything to zero because then the energy disappeared. And therefore, one can conclude from what they did is that part of the solution also went to infinity. So this is a case in which you can see that both things can happen at the same time. That part goes to zero, part goes to infinity. Right? But what we show is something completely different. We show that everything goes to infinity. And we show that everything goes to infinity, but moreover, this number C will be finite after finite time, because in general there will be a shock. And moreover, as T goes to infinity, this C will be actually the total energy of the system. Everything goes to it. Okay. So, okay, so, uh, so okay. Let me. I didn't write the equation. You know, usually people start by writing the PDE. I did not write the PDE because it is terrible. It is really frightening. So, if I would show it in the beginning, no one will listen anymore. So, I, I, I wait as long as possible before I show you the equation <laughs> to be on the safe side. But it will come. So. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we try to solve the equation dt of f is uh, quadratic in f with some quadratic which is derived for the three-wave equation. And I will explain how it is derived, so maybe it will not look too bad. All right, so it is, uh, of course, uh, non-negative because it is supposed to be density. We have to take two or more dimensions because otherwise it can be shown that these things cannot happen. And uh, so what is the collision operator Q of f? Well, it's not very hard to guess that it is this. Why it is this? Because what is this? This Q is the rate of change of the density of momentum P. Well, how the rate of momentum P changes? You have P1 plus P2 hitting each other and creating P. So that's positive number. So R is positive. And then you have two negative ones. You have two negative ones. You know, P1 hit P, uh, P2 hit P and gives you P1, and P1 hit P and gives you P2, so you lose, right? So you get one, one production and two losses, and now you have to go to the model and ask yourself, according to the model, what should be R? Well, that's also not very hard. There is a factor here which depends on the basic properties of the equation, so it is uh, some function of P, P1, and P2. And then you have conservation laws. And these two conservation laws are 
energy conservation, momentum conservation, and this is probabilities. This is just the probability that this happens, that this happens, that this happens. Okay. So that's the, so this is this is just a natural thing, and the only thing which is not clear is how to derive this quantity, but this is a computation which depends on the problem. Depends on the nonlinear wave equation that you are dealing with. Okay, so uh, we are using here f1 means means f of p1 and f2, f of p2 and so on. And uh, omega is omega of p, it's called the dispersion relation. <coughs> it is just the energy of the wave at frequency p. Right? So since we are going to deal with acoustic wave, it is just absolute value of p. All right. So. Did you, did you just say you're, you're going to study acoustic waves? Yes. Isn't that the case where the Turing theory doesn't work? Well, in th in th in three dimensions, in three dimensions, acoustic waves, pressure waves, they are. You have a quadratic equation, and it does work. You get shocks. So. When you say you know, turbulence, that it's, I'm not sure it is the same turbulence that you have in fluid. Right. I, I, would, I would say a more natural word for this kind of phenomena is, is, is uh, chaotic dynamics. That, you know, you get spreading over the whole, all levels. Uh, and here it is much more pronounced because there is also this energy cascade. So it's not that it's spreading on all levels of momentum. It just goes to infinity. On a lattice, it will spread. So for example, in the model of uh, Spohn, because the space of momentum, the space of momentum is, is a torus, over there, the analog of energy cascade would be that you'll get uh, spreading over the whole torus. So it's, 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 a, it's a different from the standard thing. OK, so uh, all right. So, uh, so this is just summarize what I said before. And you know, there, are, there is a recent book of uh, Nazarenko. There is a recent book of Nazarenko, which the, the whole book is actually showing different kind of wave equations and uh, corresponding kinetic equations and how one can analyze these equations. This is from the point of view of applied mathematics, you can see there. But there is a lot of very interesting analysis uh, in this book. All right, so uh, uh, of course, this, this goes back to the 60s, uh, this kind of ideals. And it was used uh, independently for both Einstein condensates and uh, other things. There have been numerical works. Um, I think Newell, until recently, have done some numerical works on this as well. OK, so uh, we will look at this kind of uh, dispersion relation. We look at this kind of dispersion relation, take constant to be 1 for simplicity. And uh, now we can write down the collision uh, operator in three dimensions in the following form. This is just what I said before, r minus r minus r. And this is the definition of r. And the collision term for the case that I'm talking about is going to be p times p1 times p2 in absolute value. So that's that's the model. Uh, it's it has to be quadratic uh, acoustic wave equation or uh, I think water wave also in three dimensions will give you something similar. Yeah. All right, now we are coming to the equation finally. So uh, so here is one of the main results. The energy is conserved. The energy is conserved. What does it mean that the energy is conserved? Well, this is the energy at time zero. We start with nice and smooth initial condition. This is the energy in time zero. So it's clear what it means. But the solution, the solution does not exist in the strong sense. There is a weak solution. And it's going to be in some space of uh, distributions. And uh, so the question is, what does it mean that the energy is conserved. So this is the nice thing of this analysis, is that in these problems in which people solve an equation in the weak sense and find out that a mass is lost, the energy is lost, here it is not lost. Why? 
because we are changing the space in which you are studying the equation and then by expanding the space where the solution leaves we can actually prove that the energy is not lost it is there still there it's just that it is in a bigger space so the statement is that if you go to an extended space of measures you will find out that the energy is not lost it is just there so where is it it is actually concentrated at the point at infinity you see now the interval contains the point at infinity and this measure is not the usual uh, Lebesgue measure so if you try to solve this problem by standard uh, by standard quantities and by standard integrals you are not going to see it you are going to see that the energy is not conserved in fact after finite time you will lose energy but if you solve the problem in this extended space which is what we are going to do then you will find out that the energy is conserved there's no problem everything's nice okay now we are only interested in the energy the mass is not conserved in this problem so since the mass is not conserved in this problem and we are only interested in the dynamics of the energy then the natural thing to do is to rewrite the equation for the energy so we take g to be f times omega which in this case is f times p and now we write the collision terms for g and so the collision term for g is this and it is this right and so this is this is r except that now r becomes looks like that because it is g and not f okay and so we have now an energy equation which is dt of g is equal to absolute value of p times q and g at initial condition is some nice function and it is given by this so that's the problem we would like to solve all right so now let me describe the results so uh, first of all you will see later uh, I reduce everything to the spherically symmetric case so then the problem is reduced to half dimension the momentum now is in half dimension between zero and infinity so we take an initial condition which is radial we can take initial condition which is supported away from infinity and we take an initial condition which is supported away from zero and I have to tell you what does it mean all these things uh, what does it mean to integrate about one point and so on and uh, so I will come to that in a moment so now uh, the first thing that we do in order to construct this kind of uh, measures that we need later is to extend the real line so we take the real line or half line zero to infinity and we add the point at infinity to the space and then we introduce a topology that makes this space a measure space which is compact and since this measure space is now compact uh, and we look now at we look now as our test functions is all bounded continuous functions on this space because infinity is a point in the space these bounded continuous functions have the property that they have a limit at infinity so now they have they are constant at infinity okay so because they are constant at infinity this is uh, not the usual space of continuous functions and then we ask what is the dual space the dual space you know there is a theorem about that in functional analysis that tells you that if you look at the, at the, at the dual space of all bounded continuous functions on a compact uh, space with uh, not too bad uh, topology uh, this is a space of measures again and in fact this is a space of uh, uh, measures on the space which is compact now which is from zero to infinity but it includes the point at infinity so in particular you can check that the delta function at infinity <coughs> is an element of this space okay so since delta function at infinity is an element of this space we can just walk there and uh, and then uh, now this has a meaning and this has a meaning everything is clear okay so one point now is important yes sure sure it is it is it is the it is the collision kernel which pushes everything to there but, but there's still an interaction with infinity that's the question right does the collision kernel allow one to talk to infinity actually not because we prove that uh, 
constant times delta at infinity is a time independent solution of the equation. So this is the analog, if you want, of the Kolmogorov Zakharov solution, but it is finite energy solution. Yeah. It, it satisfies the equation, but it is time independent. In this case, Q is zero at that point. Yeah, that's right. I mean, of course, this is something that one has to check. Sure. OK, so this is what I said before. This is you know, just the usual uh, mathematics, which is needed in order to add, point, add the point at infinity. It's called one point compactification, or a lot, lot of names for this. But in the end of the day, what I care about is that I have this guy belongs. By the way, this is related. Let, let me just make a heuristic comment here. Uh, why I mentioned the fragmentation coagulation equation? Coagulation equation describes things which come from biology and comes from chemistry, in which you have uh, particles with the, which have the property that when they hit each other, they coagulate. They add, you know, they become together. They move together after that. So in principle, it is possible that after finite time or after infinite time, you can create an infinite cluster. You can have a, a cluster in which you have mass infinity. This is the analog of energy cascade to infinity. It is also possible to understand for coagulation fragmentation equation, what does it mean that there is uh, going, everything goes to zero? This means that the fragmentation process is stronger than the coagulation and whenever two hit each other, they break into smaller pieces. And so in the end of the day, everything becomes sitting at zero, right? So there are all kinds of possibilities. So, and when people analyze this equation, the kinetic equation, uh, which, cause, uh, which are called the coagulation equation, they always made the distinction between the models in which the energy is conserved and the energy is not conserved. Or in fact, in their language, it is the mass conserved and the mass not conserved. So what I believe is that if you do it this way, the mass is always conserved. Because the, the infinite cluster becomes simply the delta function at infinity. Right? So it might, you know, it might simplify things. I don't know. Yes. With probability. With some probability. Um, that, that means that if you looked at the time process, you would see that there was um, condensation with certain frequency in time. Do you analyze the time uh, oh, for your cascade as well yeah. as the... Uh, yes, you will see it. Okay. Yeah, you'll see. It's actually very slow. It's actually very slow. This process is very slow. All right. So, uh, so that's what we are going to prove. We are going to prove that this energy is going, to, all this energy is going to go to infinity. So let me describe the, the statement. So uh, the first statement is that uh, the energy at infinity is actually non-decreasing. In other words, if you compute the derivative with respect to time of the energy at infinity, at one point at infinity, it is non-negative. And in particular, you can prove that it is monotonic increasing in the sense that uh, you can always find T2 such that the energy there will be bigger than what it was before. Uh, nothing goes to zero. So in other words, we started from something which has now delta function, and it will stay like that. Moreover, everything moves away from the origin in this sense. So you can always find a small, small enough interval such that the energy is less than epsilon there, near zero. Uh, the, energy, the energy at infinity actually grows and the density of the energy at infinity is larger than some constant minus another constant of the square root of t. And therefore, you can see from here that the rate of approach is very slow. It's very slow. Right. It's one over square root of t. This is, this is, this is, it looks like it's optimal. I think for coagulation equations, it was shown, at least in one case by, I think, by Perthan, that uh, 
the 1 over square root of t is optimal. It is the correct rate in which the infinite cluster is formed, I think. So, uh, so from the analysis, it seems like that this is the correct behavior. C1 and C2 are both positive. C1 is a constant. We don't, I, you know, there are some formulas for C1 and C2. But in the end of the day, you know that because ST goes to infinity, this number should be less than or equal to energy. Right? Because this is just an inequality, so. Okay. So, uh, okay, so furthermore, this inequality implies that after finite time, you have energy at infinity, which means that the solution blows up in the classical sense already after finite time. All right, so this is, uh, you know, some more precise statements about the way things are moving. It is moving in some kind of a monotonic way. So, in other words, uh, once it is there, far away, it stays there. Nothing comes back. And in the end of the day, you get that in some weak sense, the energy distribution converges to the total energy times the delta function at infinity. Okay. All right. So first of all, uh, I have to do the weak formulation. So this is the first step: is to do weak formulation, which is weak enough so that we can uh, uh, analyze the problem like that. So we look at the equation for g. We look at the equation for g, and uh, we write the equation. I told you I wait with the equation as long as possible. This is the equation. <laughs> okay. You see, that's the weak formulation. So you multiply by some test function phi, and you, you integrate the collision term, and you write it, and you get this mess. Okay. So what is the problem? You, you know, I was told that the reason Boltzmann equation is called Boltzmann and not Maxwell, it's because Boltzmann proved the edge theorem. He found out that the entropy is monotonic increasing for the Boltzmann equation. And so that's why actually he got his name on the, on the equation, even though, Boltz, even though Maxwell wrote the equation a few years earlier. So the, the issue of uh, finding a quantity which is monotonic, this is really the issue uh, for, you know, for solving this kind of problems. So I mentioned that because we use our method of solution is by finding a quantity which is monotonic for this uh, for this expression, and in and in some sense this is different from what was done, for example in the in the paper that I mentioned before by Escobado and Velasquez on the coagulation equation. What they did there is something very different. They actually started from a time-independent solution, which is a uh, found by scaling, so at infinity it behaves already the way you want it to be, and then they made the perturbation which decays faster, and then they showed a stability result, an asymptotic stability, in the sense that the solution converged to this time independent one. We are using completely different method. We are constructing actually a monotonic uh, objects for this equation. But before we do that, we have to know how to deal with this beast. V. Phi. Oh, phi so is a test function. Phi, phi is a test function that we are going to choose. Phi is a test function that we are going to choose. Is it in that uh, compactification framework? Sure, yeah. sure. It is one of those functions which are in the. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. So it will be a, it will be a function. Uh, phi will be a function with all kinds of properties all kind of nice properties, but it will belong to the, to the space of test functions. Okay. So, uh, so to deal with this beast, the first step is to reduce it to the radial case. And when you do it in the radial case, everything now is radial, including the test function, and then the equation looks like that. That's much better, but it is still, you know, terrible, because you see, you have a product of this quantity which is positive, so 
that should not be a problem. You have a product here, you have here a difference which depends on the test function, but it is a difference of things, so it doesn't have a sign. And then, unfortunately, you have this quantity which depends on the solution itself, so this g can be arbitrary function, and it is also a difference, and therefore it does not have a sign as well. So, you see, you cannot come and say all solutions are functions of a certain structure, and therefore this quantity is positive. It's just not true. And about this one, well, maybe for one phi it is true, but maybe for another one it's not true. So the question is, what do you do with this kind of thing? All right. Step two. Step two, you introduce these functions, h phi of p1, p2, which is this one, and h phi 2 of p1, p2, which is this one, and then you rewrite the equation again. And what you see is that now it is uh, the same guys that we had before, but now you see what happens is that uh, we have g of p1, g of p2, times this, times this. All of these factors are positive. This is a measure, this is a measure on the positive side. So then we have only this factor sitting here and only this factor sitting here. And these factors are, of course, very complicated because they are difference of quantities. So it looks like we have done nothing. Yes? No, mu is the measure that I constructed before. M mu is the extended, is the extended Borel measure. It's the extended Lebesgue measure to the extended real line. Right? So it includes the point at infinity. Yes, this is cheating. This is not R3. This is, this is wrong here. <laughs> but the reason, yeah, but yes, it's, 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 it's true. The reason I wrote it like that is I wanted to say that we have to think of everything now as distribution. So, right. It's true. I mean, before the blow up, you can write it like that. But after now. All right. So then you see it is a sum of two terms. And there is the sharp cutoff between uh, p1 equal to p2 positive or, right? So when p1 is equal to p2 or p1 is larger than p2. But we cannot drop this term even though it is one point. Because there could be a delta function there. So, so we, have, we have to keep two terms. Yes, I'm going, yes, radial it's test. Yeah. Radial, Everything is radial now, yeah. yes. So, but h1, you know, this h1 and h2 are, are these creatures. Yeah. Okay. Why this is good? Uh, so let me let me first of all explain why this is good. Uh, once you succeeded in writing Q in this form, you are almost there. The reason is that now the G has to be positive, and that's a quantity which is preserved under the flow. So this quantity is positive and it is preserved under the flow. So if you can prove that H1 and H2 are positive, you are done. Now, to prove that H1 and H2 are positive, how can you prove that H1 and H2 are positive? Well, they depend on phi. So now you just have to choose phi. So maybe you can find a phi such that H1 and H2 are positive, then you are done. Right? That proves that there is monotonicity. Because that proves that the right hand side of the equation has a good sign. So the key is to reduce the kernel side to something which does not depend anymore on the structure of G except that it is positive. And then you reduce all the difficulties about the sign to the choice of the test function. Okay. All right. So what is the conclusion? Well. We need to prove global existence. We need to prove global existence. Uh, by the way, from now on, there is a comment here which I put. You see that when I say dp now, I actually mean d mu of p, because I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at the space which contains the point at infinity. Okay. So from now on, dp is d mu p. Okay. So. Yes. Exactly. That's exactly the statement. That's exactly the statement. Right? 
Okay, so uh, we have to prove that there is some kind of uh, solution which is of some weak, weak form. So to do that, we will look at functions which are continuous in time and which belongs to some space of uh, continuous functions, but this space will have weak topology, and I will explain why you have to take it with weak topology, although it can also have norm topology because it is a space of functions. So, um, so, so you need to take it everything to be with a weak topology for a reason which has to do with the construction of, of a solution. So, so these solutions, are not, you're not going to have uniqueness? No, no, no. Not uniqueness. You will see, f when I explain how do you do the existence theory, you will see. What you do, I mean, let me just say it in work because I don't have a lot of time. So how do you do uniqueness? It's simple. You do the standard thing. You, you cut off all the singular parts. You know, you cut off the kernels and uh, which are singular and whatever. Everything now is nice and smooth. So now you can prove its equation is nonlinear. So you prove by a fixed point argument, by a contraction mapping, you prove that there is a local existence in time. Okay, and then because this local existence tells you that nothing has changed, you can extend local existence to global existence. So this is for the cutoff equation. Then you take the space of uh, test functions on which you did that and you take a subsequence which is convergent using compactness argument and it is in order to get the compactness you have to introduce weak, weak topology otherwise you don't have compactness right? because you have to use the fact that only in the weak topology uh, you have compactness of bounded sets and so you use the boundedness of the sets in order to uh, use compact to imply compactness and from this compactness, what do you get? That there is a sequence. And so you use this sequence to construct a solution with where the limit of the cutoff is removed. There are infinitely many ways of doing that. <coughs> infinitely many ways of doing that. No, because you see, I, if you think about the, the, the acoustic wave or whatever, what happens? There is a shock form, and then another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. In principle, who knows if this implies that the equation is not valid anymore or not? Or maybe you have to change something. I, I told the students and the undergraduates that it is their job to find an answer to this kind of questions. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> they will graduate, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Um, right. So. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I left them a few other questions of this level <laughs> to think about. So, <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So, uh, energy conservation is now in this sense, in this sense, and also we actually conclude that the mass does not grow; the mass remains uniformly bounded. Uh, and then there is a weak solution in the sense that I uh, explained, and. Furthermore, uh, the, the mass is actually bounded by the time, by the initial condition, initial condition. The energy is constant for all times. And, uh, and under this condition, that the initial condition is nice, away from zero and infinity, uh, you can get <coughs> all the other properties. So what are all the other properties? Well, of course, this is one key property. One key property of the solution is that as a function of time, the total energy at the point infinity is a non-decreasing non function, right? So it it's keep, keep growing. And then if you are given a weak solution, a weak solution, which is positive, then you can always, you can show that there is always some time where this is strictly larger than this one, finite time T1. And so, in particular, this means that uh, at some point T star, you have stuff already at infinity. So this means that the shock is formed after finite time, if you want. In the picture of wave equation, of course, in the picture of coagulation, that would mean that you have an infinite cluster formed after finite time. That's what it means. OK. Uh, then uh, nothing stays at 0. Nothing stays at zero, and uh, also nothing stays near the origin. Everything moves away. The growth rate is given by this inequality, and 
And so there is time where at least half of the energy in some sense is at infinity. And uh, the quantity far away is, uh, is, is staying larger than something for all times. So you don't have stuff going back. Right? You don't have The previous? And this one as well. Yes. You're measuring the previous energy and the p squared is the volume. p squared is the volume. Surface area. Oh, it's acoustic wave. Thank you. OK. OK. Thanks. And, and, and OK, so this is the, so this is uh, then uh, how the solution behaves. It converges in some uh, weak star sense to a delta function times the L1 norm of this quantity, which is nothing but the energy. And uh, to answer the question, uh, you can check that this kind, that this kind of initial condition is trivial. But it is a solution. Okay. All right. So now we are coming to the proof. So how the proof works? So in order to do the proof, you have to find the phi, as I said, which makes the H1 and H2 positive. If you can do that, then at least for this kind of function, you are done. However, you know, it can't be any function. Of course you can find the function, but this function has to be nice enough so it is useful, right? So it turns out that these functions do the job. So this is basically the projection. You see, this is basically the projection on P large. And this function has all kinds of other properties. Of course, it is, it is continuous. It is continuous, but it is also differentiable almost everywhere. So it is piecewise differentiable function, which is something that we need. Okay. So and then, and then what happens is that uh, these two, for these kind of functions, one can do the analysis and prove that these two, that these two operators are non-negative, and that's why everything works. Okay. Now. Uh, so here is the extra conditions on phi that we need in order to prove that H1 and H2 are not negative. We need to know that these functions are not just uh, continuous over the whole space. In other words, they are equal to a constant at infinity, but also that p squared times phi prime is bounded and phi prime is piecewise continuous. And, and, and also that there is a constant p such that this is true. And so, uh, and because our phi satisfies all these conditions, we use these conditions in order to prove that H1 and H2 are non-negative. Yes. Well, I, uh, uh, actually, we, we change R all the time in the proof, so it's not important. It's not important. The, 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 it works for every R. So you, you keep pushing R to infinity, and you show that it's still positive there. That's, that's the idea. You never differentiate around R. No, no. I mean, uh, well, you know, because it is, uh, that's why we said that uh, phi prime is piecewise continuous. Because we allow one point to be a bad one, or finitely many. Right? OK, so now, uh, if you write the equation again, uh, you see immediately that uh, you write it in terms of H1 and, and H2, and uh, you write it in the weak form, and you integrate from 0 to t the derivative on the left. Then you get this identity, which is just uh, the weak, weak version of the equation. Um, by the way, I mean, it is possible that one, yeah. one can get more estimates from what we did. Because, for example, we did not try to use the fact that there is an integral over t. And we did not try to use the fact that it could be that there is some kind of a hidden local smoothing due to time integration. You know. Does it have to be a smooth version of t? I'm not sure. You know, it is it's, it's delicate. <laughs> I mean, you try to do this for any other equation, and you see what I mean. <laughs> it's It's... It's pretty delicate. So, um, OK, so the energy is 0. So uh, you see, here is, here is one of many, many lemmas that we use. OK, two minutes. I just want to show you 
that once you have this kind of inequality using the function phi, then you can prove many, many things that I described before. The reason is that if you take the solution G and you compute, for example, the mass, uh, the energy in this case, G times P squared, on an interval R times rho to infinity, and then you can get that it is larger than something which depends on the initial data only. Why, why is that? This is because of the inequality that follows from the monotonicity of the functions phi. So this is the proof, you see? It's basically one line. And the idea is that you can replace this by that. And this is a quantity which is controlled by, by the initial data. So that's, that's, the, that's the idea which is used again and again in order to get estimates. So finally, I want to, uh, you know, the monotonicity follows from similar arguments and so on and so forth. But there is one thing which is kind of uh, surprising, which I have to explain, which is, um, which is, uh, maybe, <coughs> maybe it is here, not here, not here. We are coming to the end. Uh, this one. So how do you get this? How can you get how can you get the minus here, right? So the idea is that you, know, you only have monotonicity. You only have quantities which, have, which are growing with time. So how can you get uh, this part? The idea is the following. You, you prove that this kind of quantity from 0 to infinity, including the point at infinity, is monotonic increasing. And therefore, this quantity is larger than some constant. And then you say, let's look at this quantity again, but this time let's use the standard measure from zero to infinity, but not including the point at infinity. And use some kind of simple inequalities to get an upper bound on it. And then you subtract one from the other, and that's where it comes from. Where does the time function come in? Uh, it comes from the fact that there is an integral over time, and you use cauchy schwarz inequality. And that's how you get t1 minus t2 square root. and comes from there. Very simple. <laughs> right. So uh, here it is. Right. OK, I think, uh, yes, yeah, so finally is you know, the statement that all the energy goes to infinity, which I mentioned before. This is the end. Thank you. I don't know if they get well posed, but what I do know is that in some cases they prove that the mass is uh, not conserved, and in some cases the mass is conserved. So I guess that if they prove that the mass is conserved, at the same time they get there is unique solution. That's, that's my impression. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about this. What I can tell you is that even if you go from, uh, this is three, this is three wave equation. You try to look at the, at the kernels Q, which appears in coagulation fragmentation. It is slightly different, not much different. And we still don't know how to do the same thing. In other words, we don't know yet how to even recover the known results. And reverse cascade, Reverse cas cascade would mean basically, no, that you see, they do see reverse cascade, but it is kind of trivial. They put a term which uh, does fragmentation. So it, it dis just destroys every, every block that there is to dust. Right, but this is well, in physics, it's often very strongly natural. Uh, yes, yeah, so I really don't know how to. I really don't know. It, it, it has to enter into the kernel, and, and uh, also it depends. It depends whether you are looking at equation which is three wave or four wave. You see, it's 
it depends on that. We also don't know at, at the moment how to do four wave or combination of three and four waves. So th there are a lot of possibilities, but uh, it's I, I don't know much about uh, what happens next. So.